Shodanandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Vanachade Yamuna Tira Vanachade Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihade Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihade Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihade Jai Mishpat from Hamsa, Privada Kuchaya, the Shrotra Shrotra Shish, Mother's Vine Grace, Asa Bhakti Vedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Kantraj Shrimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. All glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to the assembled devotees, all glories to Shri Guru and Shri Gaudanga. All glories to the Prophet. Okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4, entitled Creation of the Fourth Order. Chapter 20, Lord Vishnu's Appearance in the fa- Sacrificial Arena. Text 19. Bhagavan at the Vishvatma. Katuno Parvitarhana. Samuj Hanaya Bhaktya. Vihita Charanambujaha. Bhagavan at the Vishvatma Pratuno Parshitar Hanaha Samuji Hanaya Bhaktya Vihita Charnambujaha Glenn, do you like to chant?
Would you like to chant? You're natural. Would you like to? Look. Anybody? Word by word translation. Bhagavan, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Atta, thereupon. Vishwaatma, the Super Soul. Prituna, by King Prithu. Upashita, being offered. Arhanaha, all the paraphernalia for worship. Samujhanaya gradually increased. Bhaktya, whose devotional service. Krihita, taken. Charna Ambujaha, his lotus feet. Translation. King Prithu abundantly worshipped the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who was so merciful to him. While worshipping the lotus feet of the Lord, Prithu Maharaj gradually increased his ecstasy in devotional service. Purport. When various ecstasies appear in the body of a devotee, it is to be understood that his devotional service has become perfect. There are many types of transcendental ecstasies in the, form of cr in the forms of crying, laughing, perspiring, falling down, and crying like a madman. All these symptoms are sometimes visible on the body of a devotee. They are called ashta sattvika vikar, which means eight kinds of transcendent, uh, eight kinds of transcendental transformations. They are never to be imitated, but when a devotee actually becomes perfect, these symptoms are visible on his body. The Lord is bhaktavatsal, which means that he is inclined toward his pure de devotee, bhakta. Therefore, the transcendental ecstatic transaction between the Supreme Lord and his devotee is never like the activities of this material world. Jamal, do you think you could uh, get an act of devotion, please? Sorry, I didn't ask you earlier when you were, were when you were going up there. <coughs> Om Gyan Tipadanda Sya Kananjana Shalakaya Chakshalan Melitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Makam Karitava Chalam Pangam Langa Ete Girim Yat Kripa Tamaham Vande Shri Gurun Dinitadinam Vancha Kapadru Bhishcha Kripa Sindhu Bevacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasudhi Gauda Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare Read the translation again. King Prithu abundantly worshipped the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead who was so merciful to him. While worshipping the lotus feet of the Lord, Prithu Maharaj gradually increased his ecstasy and devotional service. <coughs> so if, uh, if a living entity or if a soul 
engages in the worship of the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, uh, who is extremely merciful as this verse is saying. Thank you very much. Then gradually, that person, just like Prithu Maharaj, they will um, gradually increase, as it says here, Prithu Maharaj gradually increase his ecstasy and devotional, ser ecstasy and devotional service. And Srila Prabhupada makes a point in the purport that uh, that when one when these ecstasies appear in the body of a devotee, it is to be understood that that their devotional service has become perfect. And therefore we sing to the spiritual master every morning, Maha Prabhu Kir Tana Nuritya Gita Varitra Madhyan Manasura Sena Raumansha Kampa Shu Taranga Bhajo Vande Guroshi Charanaravindam So that verse is saying in essence that I offer my obeisances to the spiritual master who is always in gladdened by um, joyful while engaging in uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Sankirtan movement. And sometimes the spiritual master, while playing musical instruments, cartels, mridunga, different instruments, um, his mind's very in gladdened and, he, and these, these symptoms will appear. These symptoms do appear. And it says crying, sometimes he's crying, sometimes he's uh, shivering in ecstasy. Uh, and sometimes, what are the, oh, the hairs are standing on end. <coughs> like I was talking to one devotee one time, and <laughs> I won't tell you who he is, I don't want to embarrass him or something, but uh, I was talking to this devotee, and... We're talking about Srila Prabhupada, and I, I forgot exactly what we were talking about, but he said something, he said something that, uh, to the degree that, yeah, it makes my hair stand on an end. And then I said, oh, that's kind of interesting. And then I looked down at his arm. I looked down at his arm, and his hairs were standing on end. <laughs> I, yeah, literally, like his hairs were you know, standing up. So <coughs> yeah, I think he was the only one I saw. Uh, manifest that. He's he's one Prabhupada disciple here in, in San Diego, so that's the only hint I'm giving you. I'm not giving you any other hints. <laughs> um, so yeah, the spiritual master, because uh, the spiritual master is advanced in Krishna consciousness, advanced in in their loving relationship with Krishna, they're connected, they feel that. But it's not just that the spiritual master is supposed to feel that. Uh, the disciples are also supposed to feel that, gradually. And, um, and if one actually practices Krishna conscious, then they will actually come to that stage gradually. Like they have a saying, uh, perfect, uh, practice makes perfect. So... The, whatever, there's some, it's a mundane example, but there's some basketball player, big basketball player. There's always one of them or two of them or f a group of them in the world. Right now there is, I don't know their name. Famous person, right? So this basketball player, whatever his name is, shooting, shooting, shooting all day long, trying to you know, get that basketball in the hoop, right? That's the whole point, you try to get it in the hoop. And practicing other things, whatever, how to, they call it dribble. I don't know why they call it dribble, but anyways, you know, call it dribble, you know, with the basketball. And and how to, you know, jump up and, you know, slam dunk and all these things. So they're practicing. But the, the saying, practice makes perfect. But if somebody is practicing imperfectly, means they're, they're not practicing uh, in the right way, then they don't get the result. Uh, like if the basketball player is practicing and his and his basketball is like halfway pumped up with air or something, you know. It's, in other words, it's like flat to some degree. The basketball, it's going to be hard. Uh, you, you know, you have to practice with a f with a with a proper uh, basketball. 
Or, for example, in the realm of music, like um, if somebody uh, somebody learns how to play guitar in a very, you could say, speculative way, you know, they just kind of figured it out themselves to some how to play guitar. Now, when they go to a go to take some lessons, guitar lessons, you know, the guy will ask, "Hey, uh, do you know how to?" you know, play guitar, and I guy say, yeah, yeah, you know, I've been playing for years. Oh, yeah, who taught you? Oh, I taught myself. And, you know, I just kind of speculated it out, you know, figured it out. And then the guy would say, okay, we'll, we'll charge you whatever. We'll charge you $250 for the next few lessons. And then another guy comes, and hey, and, you know, the, the instructor says, uh, do you know how to play guitar? And then the guy says, Oh no, I just, you know, I, I just bought one recently, but I don't really know how to play. And, and then the guy said, okay, we'll charge you 150 for the next few lessons. And then that guy who's paying 250 go, hey, well, what, you know, what's the deal? You know, what's, what's going on with the partial, partial, what is it called? Partial. Yeah, partiality here. What, what, what's, you know, why does he pay, why do I pay more and he pays less? And then the instructor will say, well, because I have to, I have to get all that, uh, I, have to, I have to free you from all your bad habits that you develop playing the guitar. In other words, all the misconceptions you have. Um, so, so yeah, if one practices Krishna consciousness, they'll get the result. But one has to, again, uh, practice makes perfect, but a more, you could say, uh, exact term is perfect practice makes perfect. So we have to practice perfectly. That, that makes perfect. So it says, for example, that one could be chanting Hare Krishna for millions of lifetimes, but they'll never get the result. Why? Does anybody remember? Why is it, Jamal? Huh? Offensively, yeah. Inattentively, specifically. So someone would say, hey, well, I've been chanting Hare Krishna for so many years. You know, I'm not feeling the ecstasy. W where's the ecstasy? And, s and then the, the answer is that, okay, well, you have to analyze. How are you chanting? Are you chanting attentively? Are you trying to focus your mind and not think about other things? So, so yeah, but if we practice, uh, perfect practice makes perfect. If we do that in relation to Krishna consciousness and gradually these uh, different uh, ecstasies will appear within us. And it's very easy to, uh, it's very easy to, to put on a show, you know, like false, like we don't really have it, but we put on a show. Like, I don't think anybody here is doing that, but there are people who do that. Like, in at Los Angeles, during Srila Prabhupada's days, there was some man, an Indian man, and he came in, he happened to be Indian, but he came in and he started, he fell on the ground. Like it, it says here, you know, you, you fall down. It doesn't mean you <laughs> break the principles or something. It means you fall down on the ground, you know, out of ecstasy. So a man, he came into the LA temple and he would do that regularly. He would, you know, take the charnamrita and then, you know, bump against the charnamrita standing to fall on the ground and, you know, start crying and all this type of stuff. And devotees, some maybe thought, oh, well, maybe it's advanced, or but uh, eventually devotees started to think, oh, well, you know, is this for real? Is, is this serious? Uh, you know, so he just put on a show here. So then they asked Prabhupada, uh, <laughs> what should we do? <laughs> and then Prabhupada he said that, well, what you should do is that when he does that again, when he falls on the ground, you should take a stick, <laughs> and you should hit him with the stick. And if he doesn't notice, that means he's in real ecstasy. But if he notices, then that means it's false. So, of course, you could say maybe Prabhupada was joking, you know. But what they did is they went up to the man. They said, oh, you know, excuse me, you know, like, are you okay? Like, you know, what, what's going on? And, you know, you're kind of ma making a disturbance. And the guy got all upset, you know, and he you know, looked at him and he said, hey, you know, you know who I am, and, you know, don't disturb me like this. And he was all, like, puffed up, you know, arrogant. And he just stormed out of the temple room. 
and he left. <laughs> so they understood that he was just uh, being uh, a good dramatist. Is dramatist? Is that a word? You don't think so? Okay. Dramatist. Okay. Dramatist. I don't even know if that's a word either, but is it a word? Okay. Dr dramatist, dramatist, drama king, drama king. They have drama queens, drama kings. Uh, so, so yeah, it wasn't true. Now, but there are cases where, where that, um, generally devotees control themselves in relation to letting their ecstasies, like, uh, publicly displaying their ecstasies. But Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is Krishna himself, Krishna come again 500, around 500 years ago, eventually he accepted sannyas and he went to Puri, Jagannath Puri. And he went there because his mother, uh, he wanted to not be, it's not super close because Puri and Navadweep are, is quite a distance, but it's close enough, whereas Devotees from Navadweep, they go to Puri yearly, once a year for the Rathayatra, just like we go to the Los Angeles Rathayatra. The devotees would tr trek up there to the, to the Rathayatra, or down there, or over, wherever. I'm not exactly sure the geography, but they go there to Puri. And while they went to Puri, or when they went to Puri, uh, they would see how Lord Chaitanya was doing. <laughs> and then they would come back and report to Mother Shachi, Shachi Mata, Lord Chaitanya's mother. So anyways, eventually, so that was like his headquarters. So he, but the first time he went there, he came to the temple of Lord Jagannath in Jagannath Puri, which is still there. And if you happen to be Indian origin or ethnicity, your body was born in India, or your parents are Indian, then you could get into Puri Temple. Has anyone been into Puri Temple here? Yes, okay. You have to leave now? Oh, okay. So you've been to Pori. Anybody else? No? You went, never went to Pori Temple? Oh, you did? Okay. You went in the past life? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, because they have this rule that people who aren't uh, Hindus or Indians, they can't come in. So, um, But anyways, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to that temple and then he walked into the temple and he saw Lord Jagannath and Baladeva and Subhadra. And when he saw them, Lord Jagannath is Krishna, Baladeva is his brother, Balaram, and Subhadra's sister. And these are special forms in which Krishna and Balaram and Subhadra, they're actually feeling separation from um, the residents of Vrindavan, like Krishna feeling separation from Srimati Radharani, and all the gopis and gopas and kaur and all these residents of Vrindavan. So just as Jagannath is feeling separation from Srimati Radharani and the residents of Vrindavan, similarly, uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is feeling separation from Krishna. Uh, so, so yeah, Lord Chaitanya is feeling separation from Krishna. So everything's okay with Gorkesha? Oh, really? Did you call him back or no? Oh, okay. It's probably not too, uh, not too big of a deal, right? He's not probably not super important, right? What he's calling about. Oh, okay. <laughs> asking you to get some orange juice on the way home or something? Huh? Yeah. Well, to be quite honest, that was my first thought. But I didn't say it. So you said it. That's good. Because I was saying that. He's calling, hey, where, where's the breakfast? What's going on? You know? That was my first thought. But I was just saying, I'm calling. Maybe he's calling, bring back some orange juice or something. I don't know. Bring back some burritos. Uh, uh, so when the Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu walked into the temple, he saw Jagannath, Baladeva, and Subhadra, and at that particular point, he, f he went into complete ecstasy. And it said that he fell on the ground. 
but it was for real. It wasn't like it wasn't being uh it wasn't it wasn't joking or something it was serious he felt so much separation so much attachment so much affection for Jagannath that he just fell right on the ground and it said that he went unconscious and some people thought oh maybe he like left his body or something or, or and some also thought some of the guards thought oh this is just some cheater sannyasi means somebody just putting on a show so then Sarvabhama Bhattacharya appeared on the scene one uh, eventually a devotee, he became a devotee, Lord Chaitanya, but he arrived on the scene. He was a great impersonalist, Mayavadi, in, in, uh, in Jagannath Puri. Very well known, very well respected householder. So he went up to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and he put like a cotton swab, a uh, piece of cotton near his nose. And the idea was that to see if there was some, you know, breathing going on. So he put up the nose and it was breathing and, and Mahaprabhu was breathing. So then he, he got Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he brought him to his house. And then, which is close to the temple, you can still go there actually today, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya's house. And there, uh, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya, he wanted to school Lord Chaitanya. He wanted to teach Lord Chaitanya because he was thinking, oh, this is such a, this, this, Man, this, he's such a young boy. Uh, because when Lord Chaitanya accepted sannyas, he was, was it 24? 24, yeah. He was a young man, 24 years old. And, so, and he was handsome. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's Krishna. So He was handsome and young. And Sarvabhama Bhattacharya was thinking, how will this sannyasi ever maintain his vows? of uh, sannyas means, you know, no more association with women, uh, close association with women. So how will we maintain that? So Sarvabhamacharya, he taught him for like, I don't know, it was seven days. And he taught him all Vedanta, you know, uh, different aspects of knowledge. And then Lord Chaitanya, he was just sitting there. He wasn't responding. And there's a picture of it that the BBT artist uh, painted. He's just sitting there, Lord Chaitanya, like with this kind of dazed look on his face, and Sarvabhama Bhattacharya is trying to uh, speak to him. So then at one particular point, uh, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya says, are, are you not understanding, or why aren't you responding? And no questions, no comments, you know, like, what's going on here? And then Lord Chaitanya said, I understand everything clearly, but your particular interpretation is completely distorting the real meaning. So, and then Lord Chaitanya went to explain uh, Krishna and Gaudiya Vaishnavism and uh, real understanding of uh, the Vedic literatures. And Sarvabhama Bhattacharya became a great devotee of Lord Chaitanya. So, that's in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, very wonderful book. So, yeah, Lord Chaitanya went into ecstasy. And Lord Chaitanya's followers also go into ecstasy. Like, um, like Srila Prabhupada, he would, he would go into ecstasy sometimes. <coughs> like, for example, he'd be singing Jaya Radha Madhava in the morning, or whenever he would sing it. And there's particular points where Srila Prabhupada just couldn't sing anymore. He was choked up with emotion and he couldn't sing. And even he would cry sometimes. And um, there's a recording of that in, uh, I think it's Atlanta, Prabhupada's, Prabhupada's um, speaking about Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, how they're so merciful. And then, you know, it's about to be a 20, 30 minute lecture, but he just cuts it short to like five minutes or something because he's... He's choked up crying, they're so merciful, and they stop. So, uh, although Prabhupada didn't do that regularly, because uh, again, generally devotees control that like, publicly, but he, he was also apologetic at times. He would say, because devotees asked him, well, Prabhupada, what are we supposed to do when you do that? You know? And uh, Prabhupada said, apologetically, he said, oh, well, I don't do that too often. I mean, just <laughs> sometimes, but I don't do that too so, um, and there's this one, especially this, what I heard, there in, Prabhupada was in New Vrindavan, and it was, it was his Vyasa Puja, 
I believe, in Janmashtami, Krishna's appearance the next day. And Prabhupada uh, was, leading this kirt, was leading this kirtan, and all the devotees started crying. Every single one of them started crying. And the remembrances are that everybody was looking around and looking at each other, and everybody was just crying in like transcendental ecstasy. And they said that even, th even after the kirtan ended, Everybody was crying for like an hour after that. Just like uh, amazing. Due to Prabhupada's uh, association. So, uh, so yeah, the transcendental experiences or symptoms are real. And they can uh, manifest uh, within us. In the Nectar Devotion, it says... Tirtha Maharaj said one time, you know people, they, they wear these shirts. It says, uh, I lost my heart in Vrindavan. And then Tirtha Maharaj said one time, he said, oh yeah, that's nice. He said, but why don't you try to lose your heart in some of those pots back there? You know, in other words, like lose your heart in service, you know. Um... So in the Nectar Devotion, there are the five different uh, symptoms of, uh, of ecstasy are there. <coughs> specifically, specifically those who are on um, the level of, of, of bhava. And one of them is uh, not, not wasting any time. That's one of them. I'm just trying to find. Symptom of someone on the platform of, of, of bhava. Hmm. Well, okay. I found it. Praise the Lord. Okay, so it says that there are, excuse me, not five, there are uh, nine. There are nine uh, symptoms. So in other words, how can we tell if we're advanced? Of course, we should never think we're advanced, but how, but how can we tell if somebody else is advanced? Because the injunction is we should associate with advanced devotees. That's injunction, right? We should not associate with materialistic people. Asat Sangha Tyag E Vaishnava Char. Lord Chaitanya says the first um, description of a devotee is that they give up the association of non devotees. Asat Sangha Tyag. So Asat Sangha is, Asat means bad or temporary. Asat Sangha association. Tyaga, they give it up. A Vaishnava Char, that's the behavior of a Vaishnava or a Vaishnavi. Why? Because those people, they're, uh, by their association is just like poison <coughs> in the sense that we subject our mind, we subject our consciousness to materialistic uh, people, to non devotees, the associ close association of non devotees. And Srila Prabhupada says that those who are not interested in Krishna consciousness, that's a good definition of non-devotees. They're just not interested. Then that has poisonous effects on our consciousness. Whereas vice versa, we associate with devotees, and pure the better, pure devotees. Then that acts as like a, uh, as a, you could say, elixir, a nectar elixir. It acts as a um, very powerful, um, very powerful, yeah, substance to ele elevate our consciousness, that association. So this is, these are the characteristics of a uh, one on a very high platform. It says bhava, which there's sadhana bhakti, which is engaging in Krishna consciousness, following the rules and regulations of the scripture because we know it's good for us. We may have some taste, we may have some attraction for it. 
but we're not so far down the path. And then there's bhava, which means it's a preliminary stage of love of Krishna, and then there's prema. Now, amongst the stages of sadhana and bhava and prema, there's many different stages. And you could say that there's those in the beginning stages of sadhana, in the middle stages, in the later stages of sadhana, in the beginning stages of bhava. So there's different, like, shades. Um, just like it says, there's three types of devotees. The kanishta means the beginner. You know, faith is not super strong. And then there's the madhyama. Faith is more strong. And understanding of scripture is more strong. And there's the uttama, the highest. But again, there's different shades of beginners and madhyamas and like that. So anyways, uh, this describes, so here the, here's the character, uh, characteristics. So it says, he, which could also refer to she, so. But this is how Prabhupada writes it, he, so I'll read it, he. One, he is always anxious to utilize his time in devotional service of the Lord. He does not like to be idle. He wants service always, 24 hours a day, without deviation. Two, he is always reserved and perseverant. Uh, how is that word? Perseverant. Perseverant. He is always detached from all material attraction. He does not long for any material respect in return for his activities. He is always certain that Krishna will bestow his mercy upon him. He is always eager, very eager to serve the Lord faithfully. He is very much attached to chanting of the holy names of the Lord. He is always eager to describe the transcendent qualities of the Lord. And the last one, he is very pleased to live in a place where the Lord's pastimes are performed, especially Mathura, Vrindavan, or Dwarka. So then Prabhupada explains utilization of time, uh, detachment, perseverance, pridelessness, great hope, attachment to chanting. So this is all described in the nectar devotion. So, um, it says chapter, this is chapter 18, so if, you're anybody, if anybody wants to read in detail of those characteristics later. Um, so in other words, they may not, a devotee may not display external symptoms, but if they have this, then that means uh, they're, they've made progress. Um, so yeah, Prithu Maharaj, he is in uh, transcendental ecstasy due to worshipping Krishna. And it says Krishna is Bhaktivatsal, so he's always affectionately inclined towards his devotees. Um, and, it, it, and it says, therefore the transcendental ecstatic transaction between the Supreme Lord and his devotee is never like the activities of this material world. So it's... So the, the activities between the devotee and Krishna, they're difficult to understand. And it's not that the devotee is just after ecstasy or something. That it's not like they're like ecstasy uh, fiends, ecstasy addicts or something. That, yeah, we just want the ecstasy, we're just after the ecstasy. But it's just a natural um, byproduct of, of worshiping Krishna, the ecstasy. But if the ecstasy is, is to get in the way of one's devotional service, then one prefer not, not to experience the ecstasy, just like there was that devotee, um, Daruka. So he was like the, I think he was like the carrier of Krishna, like the, um, what do you call those things we don't use anymore? They used to use them instead of cars. Wagons, not exactly like a wagon, it's like a carriage, charioteer, like horse and car yeah. So he was like the driver, like Krishna's driver. So apparently one time he was, fa he was, he was fanning Krishna with a whisk, chamara. And it said he went in so much ecstasy, he was having a hard time doing it. You know, he was having a hard time. So he was praying. Krishna, please remove this ecstasy so I could, you know, fan you nicely. So if it gets in the way, then the devotee's not interested. But it is there as like a byproduct. Um, 
And just as Krishna is very affectionate client towards the devotee, so the devotee is also very affectionate client. So it's like it's like a competition, in some ways. Um, who could serve each other? Krishna serves the devotee. Devotee serves Krishna, just like Arjuna, right? Krishna was serving Arjuna. You know how? He was a charioteer. He was, you know, driving the chariot. So it's humble service. It's like a ta he, Krishna was like a taxi man, transcendental taxi man. Or he's, uh, sorry, but you know, it, it's it's actually kind of like a humble thing. It's a humble thing. I mean, being a taxi driver, it's a humble thing, actually. I mean, I don't know if taxi people like to think of themselves like that, but at least from my perspective, it's a humble thing. Just like driving Uber or Lyft. I know devotees do that. None of you do that, right? Yeah, so maybe some of the devotees who are listening online, they do that. And I'm not saying it's like some super lowly job or something, but it's a humble job. I mean, you're like picking people up, taking them. I mean, they're paying you, but still it's like, it's a humble thing. It's kind of um, so similarly, Krishna he was engaging in humble service to Arjuna. He was being the charioteer, driver. He was driving Arjuna around. Um, and then, so yeah, it's like a competition. And Krishna really appreciates devotees' uh, expressions of affection and devotion, and and uh, just like, for example, everybody's heard, but it's nice of Vidura and uh, Krishna. So Duryodhana, he, Duryodhana, he, you know, cooked this big feast and whatever you can imagine, all these different types of fancy rice, you know, saffron rice, yogurt rice, uh, Spanish rice, uh, different things. And, you know, whatever, some types of samosas, whatever, potato and peas or sweet samosas and you know, all different types of dolls, sambar, and this, and that, and, and, you know, dokla, and, you know, you could just imagine all types of different sweets, burfi, and sandesh, and sweet, so, he cooked this big feast, but Krishna, he just kept on going, he didn't want to go, I don't, because why? Because he's a non-devotee, he didn't want anything to do with it, but then he went to Vidura's house, which Vidura is very poor, he's poor, and it says he was like a shudra by nature, He's actually Yamaraj, and they cursed him. Somebody cursed him. A sage cursed him. He became Shudra Vidura in, in, in the Bhagavatam. But, which you could say is a humble position, and, but Krishna stopped at his house, and he went to, go have prasa went to go have lunch or dinner, whatever it was, at his house. And his wife was there in Vidura. So they were so excited, <laughs> so overjoyed that Krishna came to their house. So what did they do? They just, you know their complete ecstasy and then they you know they're trying to look for something to offer to Krishna and then they found some bananas so oh, here and then you know they're peeling the banana and you know offering to Krishna instead of offering the actual banana they, they offered the pill to Krishna and Krishna said oh, okay and then he just ate the pill he was eating the pill and he said that he liked it of course you know that doesn't mean we should offer banana pills to Krishna unless we're displaying some Vidura symptoms or something but Krishna liked that because it's devotion, uh, out of devotional ecstasy. Yeah, Krishna patram pushpam palam toyam yome bhakti prach. If it's offered with love and devotion, I'll accept it. And this is a special case with Vidura. Um, and the last thing is that, in relation to Krishna appreciating, uh, one time Prabhupada was in India, and. Uh, and I think a bunch of I think a bunch of women, Madhuris, devotees, Vaishnavis, they Prabhupada was sitting there with Tamal Krishna Goswami and a few devotees, and it was just you know kind of quiet, and they were talking or whatever. And then they're at somebody's house, and all of a sudden these I believe they're all women, there maybe there's a few men, but they came in, and they started they're playing all these musical instruments, you know, the flute and this and that, and they're all chanting, but they just kind of like barged in and just started you know, playing all these instruments and 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 devotees were kind of looking at him like, what is this? Because it, was, it wasn't it was planned, you know, they didn't plan that, oh, we're going to come and, 
you know, do kirtan for Prabhupada. They just like barged in and started singing and playing all these musical instruments. So Tamal Krishna Goswami and the devotees are looking at him like, it's kind of you know, strange and awkward and um, like imagine if you're if some of you are initiated here. I think only the ones on this side of the room. Right? There's two on this side of the room that are initiated. So imagine those who are initiated, or if you are initiated, or you're, you're you're heading towards initiation. Imagine if you know your guru sit in the room, you know, talking with a few people, and then you and your you know lady friends and people, hey, let's go in and let's you know br we'll bring a flute and. We'll bring a murdanga, we'll bring cartels, and we're just going to barge in. We're going to have kirtan for Guru Maharaj. And you do it. You know, you just barge in, and, you know, Radhana Swami or something's having a meeting, you just barge in, or, you know, Solon is Kirtan Swami, barge in. Um, so then devotees were looking at him, and then, and then Prabhupada was smiling. He liked it. He said he liked it, and, and then he told the devotees, he said, he said, th he said this is spontaneous Vaishnavism. He said, um, he said, they're, they're naturally Vaishnavs, they're naturally devotees. He said, you have to practice, you know. So he liked that. So, um, you yeah. <clears throat> know. So does anybody uh, have any questions or comments? I have a question. What is your sweater, Henry Co. Warriors? It's like a high school or college or? Oh, Sister's High School. Okay. Where's that? Oh, okay. okay. She gave you the sweater, huh? Hmm. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions or comments? How did I get so humble? Well, I'm not humble, so I can't tell you. <laughs> uh, he, he'll pass you the mic, because I guess we use the mic. The now. internet wants to Hare Krishna Prabhuji. So you just mentioned about that um, uh, advancement in bhakti. So uh, in others, how can we judge in ourselves that how we are advancing in bhakti or we are just still in the same uh, same row, in the same uh, class maybe? Yeah. Um, <coughs> how do we uh, judge for ourselves if we're advancing in bhakti? Well, there's... Uh, there's different ways to uh, judge for ourselves. And, and one, of the, um, one of the important ways is that, you could say the basic way is that our attraction for Krishna is, is, is developing more. In other words, when we hear about Krishna, our mind is more focused, our mind is more attracted to it. Um, when we chant uh, Hare Krishna, it's easier. It's not like, like, it becomes easier to chant. Because if it's like difficult, if it's like, oh man, it's like, I gotta take my mind and I just have to like, you know, like, because my mind's going over the place, I gotta grab it and, you know, control it. And if it's difficult, then, okay, fine, you know, that's a stage. And sometimes it's not always black and white. You know, some days it's easy, right? Some days it's more difficult. That's sadhana bhakti. But we do it, we, we engage in bhakti, whether it's easy or not. That's sadhana bhakti. But if it's becoming more easy, then uh, that's a sign then that we're making progress. Um, so if we're becoming more attracted to chanting, to hearing uh, Bhagavatam and other books, more attracted to deity worship, more attracted to the idea of just being a devotee, then that's a sign that we're advancing. And the basis of all of our advancement in uh, Krishna consciousness, or you could say the basis or the foundation for all other services and so many things, is uh, chanting of the holy name, specifically Japa. Um, <coughs> Just like Rupa Goswami, he says that he says that there's a um, prayer that he composes, and he says that one tongue and two ears is not good enough. This is paraphrasing, but he says, "I wish that I had 
millions of ears. Why? So I could hear the holy name. And he said, I wish I could have millions of tongues so I could chant, so I could chant and hear. So in other words, he had so much attraction to chanting and hearing that he wished he had millions of ears and you know, millions of tongues to hear and chant properly. Just like some people, someone was saying the other day, you know, there's breakfast. And the, apparently it was a nice breakfast. And then they were saying, just as Rupa Goswami was saying that he wished he had millions of ears and millions of tongues to hear and chant, he was saying, I wish I have millions of tongues and millions of bellies to relish this prasad. So, you know, the taste for the prasad, for prasadam, um, he had, you know. But that also has to be transferred to other forms of Krishna. So, um, but yeah, it's like a gradual process, and the more we engage in it, then, then the uh, more it actually will take place. Uh, just like um, there's that verse, Shushu Shoshadana Sya Vasudeva Kataruchi, Syan Mahatseva Vipra Punitirtana Shevana. So it says, by serving uh, devotees who are free from vice, great service is done, and one attains a traction to hearing the messages of Krishna. One attains attraction for Krishna. So in other words, and Prabhupada says in the purport that if you uh, if you associate with someone and serve someone, then you'll get their qualities. So if you serve Srila Prabhupada by reading his books, listening to his lectures, following his instructions, uh, then you'll get his qualities. And what's one of the main qualities is he has? He's a pure devotee. And similarly, if you serve your spiritual master, of course, when he's physically present, you could cook, you could do so many things, right? Do his laundry, iron his clothes, whatever, different ways, then um, you'll get the qualities. And what's the quality of the spiritual master? That they have attachment to Krishna, that they're pure devotees, that they have attachment to Krishna. So if we, and again, it's like that time factor too, that just like in, sometimes I bring up, but just like in arranged marriage. <coughs> arranged marriage means it's not that they like, have known each other necessarily for years on end. They may have grown up with each other or something like in the same neighborhood or whatever, same community, but they don't really know each other that closely, especially within traditional and even nowadays, to some degree, Indian uh, communities. It's not that they're just so closely associated with each other, men and women all the time, at least, especially traditionally. Uh, but arranged marriage means the mother, the father, the cousins, whoever, they arrange it. And, and then someone gets married, they get married to each other. So it's not like immediately there's some um, like very strong affection and, and, and like and whatever love you could say. It, but it, it, it develops over time that, you, you know, persons, they go through experiences together, they go through difficulties together, they serve Krishna together, most importantly. And then over time, that the relationship becomes more strong. So similarly with Krishna also. Over time, spending time with Krishna, our relationship with Krishna becomes more strong. And one devotee, he said that it takes time in two ways. Because it takes time means like it takes a year, two years, five years, ten years, twenty years, four decades. That's one in, what, in, in one way in which it takes time. It does take time. But another way in which it takes time is that means we have to put time into it every day. Like every day we have to spend some time, we have to put aside some time from, from our busy lives and we have to just wholly and solely uh, meditate and worship and think about and and try to connect with Krishna. And then if we do that every day, put aside some time, and then aside from that, if we do that for a long period of time, then the relationship will become more strong. 
That's the idea, so. Yes. Hare Krishna, thank you for your service. Um, one devotee recently shared that um, now is having difficulty chanting. Because they shared with you that? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's um, basically it's the, the more a uh, person's chanting, the more the impurities come up and it's really overwhelming. Oh, yeah. And, mm -hmm. So, what's the solution? Just give up? No. <laughs> Well, I'm asking the question. I asked this to Jorya Prabhu the other day, so, but I wanted to know from your knowledge what you have to say. How can, um, what kind of advice we should give that devotee that's yeah. going through that? Because it basi it's basically having a hard time chanting because it's too much, too overwhelming. And it's like, oh, I, I have to pause. So, like you said, the mind is not, can focus in. It um, creates more pain, I would say, f I mean, for them, that's what. Yeah. Instead of like, oh, I don't, want, I don't need any more pain right now, so it's kind of, let me deal with this before I can take more of my own impurities out. Yeah. Uh, well, like in the Bhagavad Gita, what, um, it says, armed with yoga, stand and fight. So Krishna doesn't say anywhere that, oh, it's going to be easy. and you know, He, he do, doesn't really say that anywhere. It says that the mind is more difficult. It's, it's, it's just like controlling the wind, very difficult. So, but he says by, by practice and by detachment, one could control the mind eventually. He says you've got to bring it back. So the mind wanders, of course, but you bring it back to Krishna. And you keep on bringing it back, bringing it back. And then eventually, the gaps in which the mind is leaves are, sh come short, become more and more short. In other words, it's like, it's like, you know, the mind wanders <laughs> for an hour or something, you know, away from Krishna. But then over time, by practice and by, you know, engaging in Krishna consciousness, it, you know, it may, maybe it's reduced. It, it goes down to 45 minutes. And then it goes down less, 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 less. And then eventually, the time in which a devotee is, you know, spacing out or not thinking of Krishna is just, you're always thinking about Krishna. But if you don't work on it, then how is it ever going to happen? So, so, I mean, it's just a terrible idea, actually. Oh, well, it's difficult. Let me give up. That is, means they're just being, um, they're being, uh, huh? Huh? Weak hearted? No, I wasn't thinking that. That's true, but that means that they're allowing Maya just to, to destroy them, you know. Of course, the soul's never destroyed, but, 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 you know, they're allowing maya, they're allowing the illusory energy to convince them that, oh, I, I, I better just give up, you know, what's the use? Because the whole idea behind maya is like Prabhupada says, you know, the material world's like a prison house, we're trying to get out, you know, go back to the spiritual world. Or at least you could say, even when we're in this world, we're trying to be Krishna conscious. So, it says that there's us, right, and then there's maya, and then there's Krishna. So maya is there to test us. As a prophet said, Maya is there to test us. Do you really want to become Krishna conscious? Or are you just trying to disturb Krishna? And for people who um, don't want to become Krishna conscious really, then, uh, you know, then, okay, Maya says, oh well, I got other plans for you. So, um, so the point is, you know, stand with, uh, armed with yoga, stand and fight. And also Prabhupada said that you know, Krishna was encouraging Arjuna to fight on the battlefield. You know, you think that's a very easy thing. It's not. And he said that one time in a lecture, he said that, uh, you know, Krishna didn't tell Arjuna, okay, Arjuna, you sit on this chariot, you smoke ganja, you know, and I'm going to fight the war for you. Mm. <laughs> he didn't say that, but he, he expected him that, hey, you, know, you fight. I'm gonna. I'll inspire you. I'll help you. But you fight, because it's you know. So we have to. We have to fight. So. Um, personally, I I know this devotee and this devotee. It's a very dedicated devotee. Very devoted. Really serious. Um, this person really wants to 
um, growing Krishna consciousness. I Do they so associate with devotees regularly? Yes, yes. They, um, so I, I know that in my heart. I know it's um, the the um, for me at least it was hard to hear that to share that personally. But I was I well, I was like, how what kind of advice I can give? You know, hard because to hear what? Well, that because I mean I didn't feel qualified to really um, answer or help much. I guess oh. in the way I wanted, but all I felt it was a lot of compassion. I would say because I think um, I have been there at times that. It's not like I want to give up, and this person doesn't want to give up. It's just more that um, it's just going through a lot, you know. Um, the thing is, if you know, if somebody doesn't take the medicine, they're not going to get better. So the problem is, you know, material consciousness, which has all of its problems. So if someone doesn't take the medicine then they're never going to get better. So, and, you know, someone may say, oh, well, I'm taking this medicine and it's making me sick, you know. It's like, okay, that might be a perception that you're, that you're perceiving, but, but whatever the case is, you know, you take the medicine, you know, according to the doctor's prescription. So I'm not saying that, you know, everyone who chants Hare Krishna or everybody needs to chant Hare Krishna because they're, you know, a total mess or something. But I'm just saying it's true, as souls, you know, we need medicine to be healthy. And not only once we become healthy, we still need to take medicine to be healthy. I mean, generally healthy people, it's not that they just take medicine when they're sick. Usually they take medicine throughout their life. You know, they take some vitamins or whatever. At least they take some food which is healthy. You know, that's like medicine, right? Some people say, Oh, this isn't my food, it's my medicine, you know. So in that way they're taking medicine, like kind of food, you know. So if somebody just, you know, prefers to be a, you know, spiritual slob or something, you know, means want to eat a bunch of junk food metaphysically or whatever, then, you know. I know people have difficulties, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be too overly, like, harsh or something, but. I just, sometimes, I don't know, sometimes I just, I don't like people's excuses, that's all. <laughs> this is going to be, pro everybody's going to hear this suggestion, you have to be careful here. Yeah. I'm saying one, uh, when we are chanting, and this all, our Falls, like falls or um, whatever misdeeds we did it, and while the chanting is keeps coming, it means it's a kind of a reminder from Krishna as well that like you see where were you and now where you are, you know. Yeah. So it's kind of purifying that person. And the other thing is the she said she's a very sincere devotee, she or he, whoever, very sincere devotee, and this and that. Maybe she's sincere now, but hearing all the time, oh, you're a good, you're good. So that's Krishna wants to give the message, then don't puff up. And he's just yeah. showing the black flash, you see? Yeah, that's true. But you're doing it. So in the same process, like in the, so many people adopt the meditation process. And in, over there, they as well say, they say, when you sit for the meditation, all the thoughts in the world will keep on coming. And you will just keep struggling, say, oh, nothing is happening to me. I'm just, all the thoughts are coming. I'm not feeling peaceful or not concentrating a second. Because the thought will keep coming because she has millions and millions of years, not even the years, the latest in what you did yesterday, what you had. So then slowly they will calm down. So I think that was the reason she was feeling like that. But it's very yeah, helpful yeah, yeah, to her, helpful to yeah, her. Yeah, that's a yeah. good point. Those yeah, are good points. To stay points. with the Krishna conscious. And, you know, it's not easy just to cover this subject in, like, one, like, answer, like my answer, because there's many, like, angles of vision to look at it from. So, um, so that's important, too, that there's a problem, right? But there's many, ha many angles how to look at it. So there's a book, actually, which maybe your friend should read, or I think everybody should read, actually. It's called Japa. And it's by Bori John Prabhu, one proper disciple. He's he's like super intelligent. He's practically, I would say, like a genius, you know. 
super intelligent, and aside from being intelligent, he's super devotional. And aside from being super devotional, he's super humble. <laughs> he's humble, and he's devotional, he's an intelligent. And he wrote this book called Japa by Boy John Prabhu. And you could, you could buy it, you know, whatever, order it or whatever. And he goes into the whole psychology of the mind and, you know, different things like this. And he does say that, that you know, when you're cleansing the heart, it's like you're cleansing, an, like, for example, you cleanse an addict, you know. But imagine you didn't cleanse it for years. And how dirty, you know. And it says that, you know, y the light was off, right? And you think, oh, it's not so bad, you know, the light's off. And, you know, you, c you can kind of see it when the light's off, right? But then you switch the light on and, oh, my God, it's like, you know, wh what's going on here? So similarly, it's like, he says, when you chant Hare Krishna, it's like switching the light on in your consciousness. And you see, oh, well, I'm not so good as I thought. <laughs> But that just means there needs to be more cleansing. We should be more serious, you know, about it. If we see that, we should be more serious, you know, not, and not give up. So, and the, yeah, my, guru, my, spirit, my spiritual master also brought this point up, is that if you commit offenses, Krishna may give you a flashback of your old consciousness, right? And if, you, um, and if you're doing good in Krishna consciousness, if you're chanting nicely, then he'll give you some... He'll give you some uh, glimpse of higher states of consciousness, you know. So that's also there. So if we commit f offenses, then you know, flashbacks of old bad consciousness. And eventually, if we commit too many offenses, then we just remain in that consciousness. And if we're doing good, if we're chanting nicely, engaged in the Krishna consciousness nicely, then we see glimpses of higher states of consciousness. And eventually, we you know we strive towards that. So. All right. Grantaraj Shema Bhagavatam Ki